Good evening, all of you, and welcome to uh, lesson two of our gradual uh, revision towards uh, 2000, I mean, 2023 Ghana School of Law Entrance Examination. So, today being a, a Tuesday, we are going to do constitutional law. As I told you, uh, every day we do a different subject in the hope that before the uh, week ends, we, or before the end of seven days, we have actually discussed uh, all the same subjects and probably save time to discuss some uh, questions as well. So that is what we are going to do. Good, so uh, tonight we, want to discuss uh, constitutional law as I have indicated, and we are starting from the very basics. So we are going to the basic introduction. And the revision I am doing with students who want to write the entrance examination. And in fact, for all LLB students uh, learning uh, any of the relevant uh, uh, disciplines of law is such that if you have even forgotten everything and you pay attention, I think that uh, you should be assisted to uh, grasp the very elementary things. And the thing about law is that if the foundation is strong, uh, the rest of the edifice is not difficult. So uh, let's make effort. Of course, uh, it may sound elementary for you if you'll be learning very hard, but as I said, uh, there is nothing like uh, overdose of uh, knowledge uh, as it were. So just uh, bear uh, with us and let us be a bit systematic. So, so what is constitutional law? Uh, well, uh, constitutional law, some would say that is that area of the law which roughly studies the constitution of a polity. Well, the person will not be wrong. Uh, if you read you know, scholars like Casey Weir, uh, you read Jeffrey, uh, you read uh, Professor Atikuba's uh, book, the new constitutional administrative law in Ghana. You read Professor Kumado's uh, book, The Constitutional Law of Ghana and its History, uh, Masopoku Ajiman, and all that. A lot of good books out there. Uh, you will get uh, to know that uh, various attempts are made to explain uh, this simple question what is constitutional law? But because we don't have the luxury of time, we are going to uh, focus on what is really essential in all the revisions that we are doing. If you are interested in actually uh, consolidating your understanding of uh, maybe something that we were a bit brief, as I've told you, there are a lot of uh, good books uh, out there. Uh, just go and read. If you read and you don't understand, you could bring up uh, questions uh, and then we will discuss them together. So let's pay attention to that. Okay, so uh, we may simply say that constitutional law deals with you know, the rule uh, powers of the institution within the states and within and, and with the relationship between them, as well as between the citizen and the state. So the governance architecture, the various organs, the various uh, bodies, which play a role within governance of a particular country. And of course, uh, those bodies, they, they be given specific functions, they be given rules, and then a relationship between them, as well as 
the relationship between these organs of governance on one hand and the citizenry, those who are governed by these uh, uh, systems, as well as the relationship between them. So all these arrangements, when we bring them under academic investigation and uh, uh, you know, learning or studies, then we have constitutional law. So that you will come to note that constitutional law is not just learning the, a particular test, which is called the constitution of a particular country. Because as you come to appreciate, or as you have appreciated from your previous uh, learning, that uh, constitutional law actually involves an attempt to acquire understanding of a variety of historical, legal, philosophical, and political factors, which over decades, over centuries, as the case may be, depending upon the particular country we are talking about, which have shaped the organization of that country. And in now uh, a part of the world, our republic. So if we take constitutional law of Ghana, we are not just interested in just knowing what is on the 1992 constitutional tablet. Of course, that is very important, but constitutional law uh, goes beyond that because uh, we have actually embarked on a, a long journey before arriving in 1992, and then we went for the referendum. We adopted the constitution 7 January 1993. It came into force, and we have this constitution, which we have operated, we have operationalized for, I mean, three decades, uh, so to speak, 2022, 1992, uh, you know, I mean, 2023, uh, 7 January, 1993, 7 January, that is 30 years, if I, my math is correct. Now, we didn't just get that. A lot of things going back into even how we came together under colonial rule and the various uh, governance experiments uh, and practices which evolved during all that period, as well as the military adventurism, which have untweeted our political history, the you know, various military interventions and the period that they rule and the, the, you know, the, the, the style of governance and how they sought to uh, tinker with the pre-existing democratic order and all that. So if we are learning constitutional law, we are interested in all those things. And that is why in the case of Tufo versus Attorney General, a very important case, if you are a student of constitutional law, as of tonight, as you listen to me, if you have never read the case uh, known as Tufo versus Attorney General, I am pleading with you, uh, make effort and read it. It is a very, uh, important case, and as you take your time to read the full uh, uh, decision, opinion, uh, Sesowa and his brethren, you will get you know a lot of insights. You get appreciation of certain basic things as far as our constitutional law is concerned, and. You look at to form as the attorney general, for example, of course, you know that our current president was a lawyer uh, who uh, pleaded the case on behalf of the, 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 the to four. And the, the court will make the points, which actually reinforces the point I am making that learning constitutional law is not just learning the constitutional document enforced at a particular point in time. It is uh, broader than that. And that is why in Tufo's case, the point to be made, and I quote, a written constitution such as ours is not an ordinary act of parliament. It embodies the will of a people. It also mirrors their history. And this is what I'm particularly interested in. It mirrors their history. 
So the constitutional law of Ghana actually reflects our historical uh, journey. And for that matter, there are certain things in our constitution. When you are reading it without the benefit of our history, sometimes it may sound too simplistic, or it may even appear some sort of like a nonsensical, like it doesn't make sense to you. But if you actually situate yourself within our historical experiences, our political and economic history, you begin to uh, appreciate some of the things that we have. If you understand our traditional and cultural arrangements, you begin to understand some of the things that we have. I'll just give you one uh, particular example. Uh, for example, if you look at Article 3 of the Constitution, uh, Clause 1, Parliament shall have no power to enact a law establishing a one party state. You look at that and you say that, what is the point? Because already you have stated in your constitution, you have stated in the preamble of the constitution that you are adopting a constitution which will secure for you and your posterity the blessings of liberty, including democracy. So if you have democracy, why should you be worried about having a dedicated provision in the constitution, such as Article 3, saying that parliament shall have no power to uh, pass a law which will make Ghana what? One party state. However, going by the point earlier made, if you have the benefit of the knowledge of history of Ghana, and if you remember certain antecedents, such as the development in 1960s, uh, 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 right after the first uh, uh, Republican constitution, uh, when uh, parliament actually passed a law to declare one political party, uh, Convention People's Party, as the only political party in Ghana, and all other political parties were by implication at law. Then you begin to understand why we have this particular uh, clause. Or if you remember uh, during the military regime of uh, General Kutu Echampo, something called UNIGOF, right? Union government. When he wanted to return Ghana to uh, you know, democratic rule, he envisaged and started showing the idea of union government, sort of a partnership between, if you like, the civilians and the, you know, the, the military. Uh, and of course, it didn't work out. So therefore, if you know all these things, you begin to appreciate the wisdom of having uh, a provision which says that under no circumstance shall Ghana, shall parliament have the power to pass a law making Ghana a one party state. There are so many examples which can be uh, cited, but I just cited one, just reinforce the point that uh, I was making. And again, if you look at uh, the dictum from uh, the first case again, the point was made that account therefore needs to be taken of it as a landmark in the people's search for progress. It contains within it their aspirations and their hopes for a better and fuller life. So learning constitutional law is not just trying to know the, the test of the constitutional document, but it is also attempt to understand the efforts which the people of Ghana or with particular group of people that uh, we are talking about as far as their constitution is concerned, are making to try and build a better society for themselves. So the constitution therefore is not just for fun. It is, it's got like a purpose. It's taking us to a certain destination. No wonder in our constitution, we have chapter six, uh, which we call the directive principles of what? State policy. And the directive principles of state policy, if you study them well, you get the, 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 the sense, the, the, the kind of, the, the, the vision, right, of society. 
the kind of society that we eventually want to see established in Ghana. So that is the point about constitutional law. Uh, as I said, if you haven't read the to Forbes Attorney General, please uh, make time and read it. So having understood what constitutional law is, you want to ask a question. What is a constitution? What is a constitution? Of course, it sounds uh, uh, very uh, simple. Again, if we had time, uh, various attempts have been made to explain uh, what the constitution is. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, uh, the various attempts, we can probably uh, reduce them into two uh, perspectives. So what do you call like the, the narrow uh, perspective and then the broader uh, perspective. Uh, the, I mean, the narrow sense, uh, that is to say that uh, you are looking at constitution as a part of, as a, you know, the body of a, uh, <clears throat> you know, rules for governance reduced into a particular test, right? The body of rules for governance, you know, for governance in a particular polity, which is reduced into uh, one uh, test, uh, as it were, so that you can take the 1992 constitution of Ghana, and that is a constitution. But that is a constitution in a narrow sense. You know, constitution uh, broadly understood uh, goes beyond uh, just the uh, the test of the constitution, uh, as uh, I indicated. So the broad understanding of uh, constitution, uh, we are looking at uh, all that is entailed, right? The entire uh, uh, process of uh, creation and adaptation by whatever means of institutions and practices of governance of a particular country. You know, as uh, Professor Jando and his uh, co-author Griffith will tell us that all the various things involved, the various processes, right? The various processes and uh, practices, uh, which uh, the particular society uh, go through, try to adapt the best uh, system of uh, attending to its governance, its development, all those things are part of the constitution of the country. So that is the, the, the broad understanding of a constitution. So therefore, if you like the broad approach, the constitution of Ghana is far bigger than the 1992 constitution. But if you use the narrow approach, uh, then that is the 1992 word, uh, constitution. But even then, if we take the 1992 constitution, it goes beyond the test of the 1992 constitution because having operated the constitution for three decades, 30 years, and I'm sure that uh, the constitution is older than uh, some or uh, most of you uh, who are, are taking the course at this point in your life. Uh, thank God that, uh, I have the, the privilege to be you know, alive when we went to join the queue for referendum uh, April 1992, and then we gave birth to this constitution. So uh, having operated this constitution for three decades, uh, we have tested uh, many aspects of it. And the testing of these aspects uh, have also reflected in our jurisprudence in the, the litigation before our courts, especially the Supreme Court. And if you were to do a survey of Supreme Court decisions in relation to the 1992 Constitution, and to some extent, uh, decision of maybe other superior courts, especially when it comes to a uh, parliamentary election petition uh, with terminates at the Court of Appeal, you would notice that uh, the last 30 years, 
you can, if I am not exaggerating, you can probably get uh, 100 cases or more than that, as far as the 1992 constitution is, what, is concerned. And there are various provisions uh, which have been clarified by these decisions. And for that matter, if you have been using the narrow understanding of the constitution, it's not enough for you to just take the, the provisions of the 1992 constitution. And that is why in examination, if a question is asked, right? And all that you know about constitutional law is what article this said, what article that said, uh, you will not get the full maps because most of these provisions have actually been pronounced upon. Either they have been uh, interpreted or they have been applied in terms of uh, enforcement. So therefore, uh, if you cite them, you should also give us the benefit of case law, uh, which has actually interpreted or enforced that provision. And that is why uh, for most of the key provisions, I will advise you to get at least one relevant uh, you know, decision of the Supreme Court, as the case may be. And the good thing is that there are some of the cases, if we read them, they hold good for a lot of constitutional principles and provisions of the constitution. So that is the other good thing about it. Okay, now having understood what the constitution is, uh, we will quickly move to how constitutions are classified. Uh, in terms of the characteristics you know, of the constitution, uh, the fact that uh, constitution is a fundamental law, constitution evolved uh, over time. Constitution, if it is a, you know, a written constitution, you notice is a product of the constituent power. If we say constituent power, that is to say that uh, a group of people who were empowered to actually uh, organize whatever document we are going to adopt as a constitution, uh, did their work, and then the whole uh, citizen who are eligible to exercise franchise, eligible to vote, were given the opportunity to actually uh, determine, usually in a referendum, as whether the constitution uh, should be adopted or not. So typically, that would be a written constitution because you have a single document which you can point to as embodying, if you like, the, the, the constitution and which has also emanated from the constituent uh, assembly. So in Ghana, we have what we call the constituent assembly, which was like, you know, we put people together just like the parliament to deliberate on the committee of experts report and all that. They made their final recommendations. And then all of us, as the constituent power, we Ghanaians, then we adopted that document for ourselves as a constitution. Now, constitution may also be unwritten. And I must say that unwritten constitution, the commonest example we can point to is UK's constitution. Of course, not only UK's constitution, if you go to some of the Arab countries, right? where they haven't moved to full-blown constitutional democracy. To some extent, we could also say that the concept of unwritten constitution applies to them because you will not be able to point to one single or one, a specific document comparable to the constitution of the United States or the constitution of the Republic of Ghana, in which you can say that this is the constitution. Rather, what constitutes the constitution in those places, including the United Kingdom, is that there may be some scattered documents as well as conventions, right, and practices, uh, which constitute like the, 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 the constitution uh, as uh, it were. Then a constitution may also be classified as rigid or flexible. 
Now, this classification is based upon how easy or how difficult it is to change, to amend this constitution. So therefore, where it is generally easy to amend the constitution, we say that it is a flexible constitution. On the other hand, where it is relatively difficult and cumbersome to amend the constitution, we say that it is a rigid constitution. Well, in Ghana, I will invite all of you to go to chapter 25 of the constitution and look at article 289 to 292, uh, which governs amendment of the constitution. You will notice that the provisions of the 1992 constitution, more or less, have been put in the two main categories, what we call entrenched clauses, and then what we call non-entrenched clauses. And you will notice that as far as the non-entrenched clauses are concerned, they are amended in the same way as ordinary legislations are enacted in accordance with Article 106 of the Constitution. However, for the entrenched clauses, they relate to very sensitive aspects of the Constitution. And we do not want them to be amenable to uh, you know, easy change. The slightest uh, problems that we have then we want to uh, change it. It's not uh, really uh, like that. And for that matter, the entrenched provision, you have to go through difficult, you know, very cumbersome procedure, including referendum, including referendum, before you can amend it. And I want to give you a simple example. You notice that the chapter on local government is entrenched and there is a, a provision there relating to selection of the district chief executive or the municipal chief executive. Now, if you look at the two main political parties, the New Patriotic Party and then the National Democratic Congress, uh, you know at various points in time, you'll be campaigning that maybe we'll like to amend this so that the people will have to decide who they want to be their DC rather than the central uh, government uh, nominating some people for the assembly to you know, decide. A, a time was made, if you remember recent political history of our country, to try and amend this. But I think the, the survey indicated that not enough uh, education have been done for people to buy into it. And for that matter, if referendum were probably to be done, they were, you know, we are not going to get enough people to agree that it should be amended. And for that matter, the, 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 the government uh, had to abandon the idea. I, I have said this just to let you know uh, how difficult it is to amend an entrenched provision. Now, a question I'll ask is this. With reference to chapter 25 of the constitution, can we classify Ghana's constitution as rigid or it should be classified as a flexible constitution? Probably, this is the type of question uh, you may have to answer in a typical lawyer's fashion. And uh, typical lawyer's fashion means that uh, you say that it depends. It depends in the sense that uh, you could make, uh, you can get you know, good arguments from examples in chapter 25 to illustrate the point that maybe to a large extent, the constitution is uh, rigid. 
And then you can also get some other example to say that the constitution is not uh, completely rigid, but there are some aspects which are amenable to amendment. And for that matter, it is flexible. Now, quite apart from that, constitution may also be classified as federal and unitary. Of course, uh, federal uh, constitution, we are talking about uh, where the uh, powers of uh, governance, right, uh, is actually distributed between the constituent uh, parts and then the central uh, government. So you have the, 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 the constituent parts, like the states, like Nigeria, for example, and then you have like the, 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 the central government. So there are some matters which only the central government does, as in the federal government is competent to do, typically uh, matters of, let's say, foreign affairs, defense and all that. But there are some other matters which the constituent parts, the various states, they have the competence to actually uh, deal with them. So that is the federal government. The typical example, United States of America, and to some extent, uh, Nigeria. Now, unitary, uh, uh, the government or unitary constitution on the other hand, is where you have everything uh, together. You have everything you know, you know, centralized and you don't have a split of governance power between any central and if you like uh, other parts. Of course, one may say that what about the local government that we have? Is it not an example of federal uh, constitution? No, it is not. Uh, the district assemblies and all that, they have very limited powers. They, their power just relate to very basic things. Uh, they don't have, you know, the, apart from market tools and things like that, they cannot uh, you know, create uh, any serious revenue through you know, major taxation and so on and so forth. They don't control even like the, the police. It's still controlled by the central government and all that. So that is not the example. Now, if you remember later on, if we discuss evolution of uh, constitution of Ghana, historical evolution, we come across a period uh, 1954 to 1957, when there were agitations by the National Liberation Movement, which brought about Matemehu uh, agitating, of course, mainly from um, the uh, Ashanti and other Akan areas that uh, if Ghana was to become independent, they would like Ghana to have, uh, if you like, a, a federation so that uh, some of those places could be more or less like uh, self governed and have very uh, limited interaction with the central government. But as you remember, there was a, a referendum and uh, that did not actually find favor with majority of Ghanaians. So that is the only time when uh, Ghana were confronted with deciding whether to go on the path of federation or to be unitary. And we opted for a unitary constitution. And that has been so uh, ever since then. Constitution may also be classified as Republican uh, as opposed to monarchical. So monarchical constitution is where uh, powers of government is actually exercised by a monarch a monarch being a king or a queen. So the executive authority is uh, mainly exercised by you know, executive authority and even the lawmaking exercised by like the monarch. And until the adoption of the Human Rights Act of UK by its uh, association with the uh, EU and all that, uh, Human Rights Act of 1998, uh, in Britain, you, you, you have like a, a proper appreciation of you know, monarchical government. And that is where uh, we told that 
the king or the queen in parliament. That the working together with parliament can make anything except to turn a male into a female or a female into male. In mind that we have uh, these uh, science, medical advances with this uh, possibility of uh, uh, gender uh, no change through surgery procedure and all that, uh, that uh, basic or that cliche may even be no longer valid. And you go to the Saudi Arabias and all those, most of these Arab countries, they still pro practice uh, monarchical constitution. Now, Republican uh, constitution is what we have. And uh, we've had that since uh, 1960. We've had that since 1960, meaning that both the executive authority and also ceremonial dimension of executive authority are actually vested in elected uh, persons and not people who get authority by reason of descent or by reason of uh, blood relation. If we, we take monarchical constitution, uh, people get political authority by reason of uh, having coming from a certain uh, descent and so on, or certain blood ties. But it's not so with Republican uh, institution. Then we also have presidential as opposed to parliamentary constitution. A presidential system of government or presidential constitution, uh, also known as a monocephalous uh, constitution or government is a, a, a type of a constitution in which the, there is a, a, a separation between, uh, <coughs> sorry, in which you have the, the fusion of uh, the ceremonial you know, dimension of uh, government authority and then the rare executive in one person. So presidential, you know, the same person is both the ceremonial. If we say like the ceremonial, you know, that is uh, those who uh, receive other uh, diplomats or other heads of states, uh, those who actually, you know, sign uh, treaties and all the, you know, the ceremonial aspect of what make us as a, a sovereign nation. Uh, the leader who sees to that, you no, know, that is the president. At the same time, the president and uh, the presidential system is also the effective government. So you don't have like a prime minister, someone being a prime minister and another person being the ceremonial head. If you go to the parliamentary system, also known as the bicephalo system, you have like a spread of executive authority. We have a ceremonial dimension and the effective uh, 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 government dimension. So you have like a prime minister who is the head of government. And then you have the someone who is called like the head of state who exercise the, the, the ceremonial uh, role. Of course, uh, in France, uh, Russia, and so many other countries, we have the parliamentary system. But Ghana, uh, we have the presidential system and under the 1902 constitution. That is what you opted for. Uh, under the Second Republic, that is the Nazis Dan constitution, we actually uh, went back to the parliamentary system because of our uh, the displeasure with how the presidential system fed under President uh, Kwame Nkrumah when he eventually turned Ghana into one party state and all that. So Second Republic, we went back to the parliamentary system. However, it did not uh, really live long. And since the Third Republic and then the Fourth Republic, we haven't gone back to the parliamentary system. Now we have just the presidential system, meaning that one person is the head of state, and at the same time, he is the head of government. And if you go to Article 57, right, 
If you go to Article 57 of the 1992 Constitution, uh, Clause 1 says, and I quote, there shall be a president of the Republic of Ghana uh, who shall be the head of state and head of government and commander in chief of the armed forces of Ghana. So that is, if you like, the ceremonial dimension. And again, we also have uh, a provision uh, which says that the executive authority, Article 58, right? Article 58, one. The executive authority of Ghana shall vest in the president. So Article 57, Clause 1, and Article 58, Clause 1 actually reinforces the point that our constitution is a presidential system and not parliamentary one, uh, system. Then a constitution may also be bicamera or unicamera. When a constitution is bicamera, uh, that is to say that. As far as uh, its lawmaking uh, 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 body is concerned, you have like uh, upper chamber and then uh, uh, lower chamber. So you have uh, two compartments. So maybe that's a, like in the United States, having like the, the Senate and then the House of Representatives. Then all together, they form like the Congress. When you go to uh, you know, United Kingdom, they have the House of Representatives, I'm sorry, they have the House of Commons, and then they have the House of Laws. And together, they form a parliament. Now, in Ghana, we have only one. And for that matter, ours is in the camera. We don't have like a, a duality of legislative chamber. We have just a single a legislative chamber, so it is unicameral. Of course, there has been argument, and I will encourage you not to brush it aside, to think about it, because don't forget that uh, apart from the Constitutional Review Commission work in 2010, uh, there has recently been an attempt uh, by group of law uh, makers or some institution to also revive this uh, debate about constitutional reform. And if we are talking about constitutional reform, and of course, having practiced the constitution for 30 uh, years, it is a subject that uh, it is uh, useful to uh, think about it and uh, have some ideas. Who knows? Nobody knows which of our question will come. So that assuming uh, you are lucky, you have something like that, you, you have something to write. Now, in that respect, there has been this thinking that instead of having council of state, right, just being the way that it is, let us reconfigure, let us repackage council of state so that it will become a second chamber of parliament. So it will not be a bad idea for you to, for example, think about that. I'm not saying that there's anything like that, but uh, since we are talking about constitutional reform, uh, it's useful to think about that. And if that were to be the case, that is to say that we are going to move from being in a camera constitution to what? By camera constitution. Good, so these are some of the basic ways in which constitution may be classified. In terms of sources of constitutional law in Ghana, I do not want to uh, worry you because the authoritative position is Article 11, constitution, and all the sources which are adumbrated in Article 11 are sources of constitutional law in Ghana. So the constitution itself, uh, various enactments, as well as existing law, and even the common law, the customer law of Ghana, they are all important sources of norms which constitute constitutional law of Ghana. So it's not just the 1992 constitution only, but other uh, sources, as I have indicated. And then quite apart from these sources, 
there are some useful uh, historic documents which provide uh, good insight or illumination into our constitution. For example, when we are students, we know the two volumes of the, what do you call the two G and G, Jando and Griffiths. Uh, when uh, we had the you know, death or scanty publication in the country, uh, these were very uh, important source books. And of course, if we look at the report of the Constitutional Review Commission too, it is a very uh, important, uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, document which also provides information on uh, constitutional law of Ghana. We are going to continue. Unfortunately, I said we are doing uh, 40, uh, five minutes and we have hit the 45 minutes. So I will stop and then allow uh, five minutes of uh, Q&A and then we end the session. So if you want to speak, uh, just put up your hand. So we have five minutes to do that and then we'll end. Uh, yes, Abdul. Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, please, mine is a, is a concern. Okay. 